Deep within the human psyche are certain predisposed ways to act and think stemming from our biological evolution, which we inherit in our genes. These are known as archetypes, and while their main purpose is to help us deal with typically occurring situations, they also make an appearance in our stories and myths. These stories serve as guides, illuminating the deeper aspects of our minds, while also guiding us along the paths which humanity has traversed during our psychological evolution, from animals to conscious beings with a spiritual dimension. And this evolution is far from over. Each new generation of stories re-examines old archetypes, but places them in a new context, deepening our understanding of the human mind, while also forging new paths for us to traverse. The novel Dune by Frank Herbert is one such story. This classic sci-fi work is a masterpiece of reiterating familiar archetypal themes, and it is as much a potent examination of human psychology as it is an epic tale of revenge set amidst a future in which humanity has pushed itself to the very limits. Like every new story, Dune doesn't merely recapitulate archetypal themes, but evolves them and takes them further. The story of Paul Atreides and his journey on Arrakis isn't just a retelling of the hero's myth, but rather it explores what it means to be the chosen one, and to tightly grip people through their unconscious minds to the point of fanaticism. In this sense, Paul is both a hero and a villain. The result is one of the greatest and most inspirational science fiction works ever devised, which, when analyzed from the perspective of depth psychology, reveals much about the nature of consciousness, the unconscious, and the relationship between them. Psychological evolution is at the heart of Dune. Each page is brimming with a complex analysis of the intricacies of the human mind, emphasizing the mind's extraordinary capacity to transcend its own limits and become godlike. In fact, I would say that the main theme of the book is exploring what it means to be a living god. I can't overstate how incredible this book is, especially from a psychological perspective, which is why I've decided to produce an in-depth analysis of the archetypology of Dune. While I will discuss many important aspects of the plot, this video will not be a complete plot summary, since there is no way I can do the whole book justice. So if you haven't read the book or watched the movie, I would encourage you to do so, since it will help you to appreciate just how incredible Paul Herbert's sci-fi classic really is. Without further ado, let us dive into the archetypology of Dune. Dune takes place in a future where humanity has spread to thousands of new worlds and has evolved considerably in order to survive in new environments. In this future, artificial intelligence has been eradicated during an event known as the Butlerian Jihad, where the fear of artificial minds replacing human minds led to their total destruction. In the aftermath of this event, humanity was forced to adapt quickly, and instead of computers, began using their own minds as a substitute, becoming human computers capable of immense feats of computation and prediction. In order to navigate the stars, human computers, known as spacing guild navigators, use their minds to calculate a trajectory through deep space. Doing so requires a rare drug known as the Spice Melange, a substance which is central to Dune's story, and which, as will soon be shown, is highly symbolic. This substance is only known to grow on the planet of Arrakis, a desert wasteland inhabited by the Fremen, natives of Arrakis who have been there for thousands of years, isolated from the rest of humanity. Spice mining on Arrakis drives significant competition throughout the galaxy, since space travel is impossible without it. Each planet is ruled by a great house, and each great house is ultimately ruled by the Padishah Emperor, the supreme ruler of all of humanity across the stars. The story begins on the planet Kaladin, ruled by the great house Atreides, as the heir of House Atreides, Paul, pretends to sleep, he overhears a conversation between his mother and the Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mahayim. Both Paul's mother and the Reverend Mother are members of the Bene Gesserit, a secretive order of women who are attempting to breed a superhuman known as the Kwisatz Haderach, and through their conversation, Paul learns that he may be this superhuman. The Reverend Mother, however, is keen to prove that Paul isn't the Kwisatz Haderach. The Reverend Mother is, as her name alludes to, a symbol of the Great Mother. The Great Mother motif is an archetypal symbol with a light and dark side. And while Paul's own mother represents the light side, the Reverend Mother represents the dark side. If you have seen my video on the psychology of the Great Mother symbol, you would know that the evil Great Mother confronts the hero and attempts to obliterate his consciousness and autonomy. This devouring symbol represents the independent human consciousness being absorbed by the animality of the unconscious mind and the evil mother is an agent of this development. 
As Eric Neumann wrote in The Origins and History of Consciousness, the overwhelming might of the unconscious, i.e. the devouring destructive aspect under which it may also manifest itself, is seen figuratively as the evil mother, whether as the bloodstained goddess of death, plague, famine, flood, and the force of instinct, or as the sweetness that lures to destruction. The Reverend Mother arrived at the home of the Atreides to administer a test to Paul, to see if he is truly the Kwisatzhaderach. Paul himself possesses an exceedingly developed level of consciousness, far removed from his animal instincts. Paul sensed his own tensions, and decided to practice one of the mind-body lessons his mother had taught him. Three quick breaths triggered the responses. He fell into the floating awareness, focusing the consciousness, aortal dilation, avoiding the unfocused mechanism of consciousness, to be conscious by choice, blood enriched, and swift flooding the overload regions. One does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. The animal destroys and does not produce. Animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focus consciousness by choice. This forms your grid. Bodily integrity follows nerve blood flow according to the deepest awareness of cell needs. All things, cells, beings, are impermanent. Strive for flow permanence within. Clearly, Paul's consciousness transcends most other humans, and in fact, he was genetically designed to possess an extraordinary mind. Despite this highly developed psyche, the Reverend Mother, true to her role as an evil Great Mother symbol, attempts to obliterate his consciousness. The test is simple. Paul is presented with a green box into which he is to place his hand, and he cannot remove his hand until the test is over. If he does, he will be stabbed in the neck with a poison needle, the Gom Jabbar, and will die instantly. A duke's son must know about poison, she said. It's the way of our times, eh? Musky to be poisoned in your drink. Umas to be poisoned in your food. The quick ones and the slow ones and the ones in between. Here's a new one for you. The Gom Jabbar. It kills only animals. Pride overcame Paul's fear. You dare suggest a duke's son is an animal? He demanded. Let us say I suggest you may be human, she said. The Reverend Mother describes this test as one which distinguishes humans from animals, by which she means those who are gripped by their animality from those who have transcended it. Placing his hand inside the box will subject him to excruciating pain, pain which he must suffer through without withdrawing. As the pain intensifies and the urge to withdraw increases, Paul recites to himself a mantra which has become famous. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. It is true that fear can cause us to revert to our unconscious chaotic selves, being gripped like deer who flee in panic. But overcoming this fear through the sheer will of our conscious minds is the true meaning of courage. One who has mastered himself can use his consciousness to override his instinctual impulse to panic and succumb to fear. The Reverend Mother's attempts to revert Paul back into an animal fail, and Paul successfully overcomes her desire to destroy the stability of his psyche, as she remarks to him, You've heard of animals chewing off a leg to escape a trap. There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. But the pain, he said. Pain, she sniffed. A human can override any nerve in the body. Consciousness can in fact overcome pain, as we push ourselves to accomplish any difficult feat, and it is this ability which has been instrumental in shaping the human world. Paul has proven that his consciousness has transcended its animal limits, and the purpose of this test is revealed to him. This is when Paul speaks about dreams he has been having, of a woman on the planet Arrakis, a woman whom he knows he will meet in the future. This woman is Chani, and she represents Paul's anima, first appearing in his unconscious dreams, and we will have much more to say about her later. The Lady Jessica, Paul's mother, and a symbol of the light side of the mother archetype, was an instrumental tool in the Bene Gesserit breeding program, but when she was ordered to produce a daughter, instead had a son, betraying the Bene Gesserit, the first signs of autonomy from the will of the Great Mother. This theme of using one's consciousness to transcend their seeming limitations can be found all throughout the book. For example, Take this exchange between Paul and Gurney Halleck, one of Paul's mentors, during a knife fighting practice. I guess I'm not in the mood for it today, Paul said. Mood. Halleck's voice betrayed his outrage. 
even through the shield's filtering. What has mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle, or making love, or playing the baliset. It's not for fighting. Like pain, consciousness can also override our own emotions, allowing us to act even when we don't feel like it, whenever the need arises. Or take this passage from the Orange Catholic Bible, a religious text within the world of Dune. Think you of the fact that a deaf person cannot hear. Then what deafness may we not all possess? What senses do we lack that we cannot see and cannot hear another world all around us? The book refers over and over again to a higher consciousness capable of becoming aware of things beyond our biologically endowed sense perceptions. The House Atreides, led by Paul's father Leto Atreides, was ordered by the Emperor to take over the fiefdom of the planet Arrakis, the desert planet known as Dune. Arrakis was previously governed by the Harkonnens, who also happened to be the Atreides arch rivals, and who are scheming to destroy Paul and his father. On Arrakis, the Harkonnens persecuted the local people, the Fremen, believing them to be little more than uncivilized barbarians. The Atreides arrive on Arrakis, hoping to present themselves as better leaders than the Harkonnens. It isn't long before the Harkonnen plot comes to full fruition, and the Atreides are betrayed from within. Leto is killed, while Paul and his mother Jessica manage to escape into the desert. The Lady Jessica, like her son, also possesses an advanced consciousness, mentally preparing herself for the hostile climate. How the mind gears itself for its environment, she thought, and she recalled the Bene Gesserit axiom. The mind can go in either direction under stress, toward positive or toward negative, on or off. Think of it as a spectrum whose extremes are unconsciousness at the negative end and hyperconsciousness at the positive end. The way the mind will lean under stress is strongly influenced by training. Arrakis is a hostile wasteland where only a few forms of life manage to survive. It is also the one place where spice melange can be harvested. The archetypal significance of the desert is something we have discussed before. Deserts are lands of deprivation, where only those with strong wills are able to survive. It is in an environment like the desert in which our humanity is tested, since one can easily lose themselves to chaos, and the deserts of Arrakis possess many secrets. Jesus, whom Paul parallels in many ways, spent 40 days in the desert where he encountered the devil, essentially his dark side and a manifestation of his primitivity. The extreme conditions of the desert and lack of water often cause people to encounter hallucinations, which are manifestations of their own unconscious minds, and the character Liet Kynes experiences hallucinations of his father while stranded in the desert. Muhammad, another figure whom Paul parallels, also experienced hallucinations in the desert, and through such hallucinations founded an empire which dramatically changed the course of history. The desert pushes our consciousness to its extreme limits, but enduring the trials of the desert can make a man great and prove that his will to survive is steadfast, and is superior to his desire to simply give up and die. It is amidst the dunes of Arrakis where Paul and Jessica first encounter the great sandworms of Arrakis. These enormous creatures roam the deserts, always lurking beneath the sand, ready to attack anyone who disturbs the sands, and in many ways play the role which dragons commonly play in mythology. They are seemingly unconscious, snake-like beings, and like dragons, they can be seen as representing the primordial portions of the human mind. This animality opposes our consciousness, but we can't simply get rid of it, since it is a fundamental part of a human being. Union with this other half gives us the symbol of the self-archetype, the union of opposites, of conscious and unconscious. When under the control of the conscious mind, this aspect of our nature can serve us, but if we lose control, it can become chaotic like a wild beast. After escaping from the sandworms, Paul and Jessica encounter a band of Fremen living in the desert. Among them is the woman Chani, whom Paul first glimpsed in his dreams. Paul swallowed. The figure in front of him turned into the moon's path, and he saw an elfin face, black pits of eyes. The familiarity of that face, the features out of numberless visions in his earliest prescience, shocked Paul to stillness. He remembered the angry bravado with which he had once described this face from a dream, telling the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mahayam, I will meet her. Paul later forms a relationship with Chani, and she becomes pregnant with his son. The Fremen are natives of Arrakis, and they have a special connection to the planet. They possess specialized still suits which allow them to recycle the body's moisture and are necessary for living in the desert. Their religion tells of the prophecy of the Lisa al Gaib, the son of a Bene Gesserit, who will come to lead them in their fight for freedom. This prophecy isn't a coincidence, but was actually implanted by the Bene Gesserit 
as a way of controlling the Fremen. We should probably discuss the Chosen One motif, since the Chosen One is, like many other symbols, a symbol of the self-archetype. Messiah figures, operating through the self-archetype, appear as the saviors of humanity, who come to restore balance to a world gone astray. This idea is extremely possessive, and can lead to fanatical beliefs about the Chosen One, and a blind willingness to obey their every command. The Bene Gesserit implanted this prophecy amongst the Fremen, as a way for the Kwisatz Haderach to control them. And this isn't just a fictional premise. The archetype of the self is incredibly gripping when projected upon a savior figure, as history often shows. Many people throughout history have claimed to be the chosen savior, and by doing so gained immense power and sway over the minds of their followers. The self archetype, when seen in others, gives such messiah figures an aura of divine legitimacy. Paul, like Jesus, is a symbol of the self archetype, and even the prophecy of the Lisa al Gaib is described as following the familiar messiah pattern. The reason this pattern is so familiar is because it originates from within the psyche of every individual. Paul is even aware of the extent to which he is playing a mythical figure in order to sway the minds of the Fremen. Greatness is a transitory experience. It is never consistent. It depends in part upon the myth-making imagination of humankind. The person who experiences greatness must have a feeling for the myth he is in. He must reflect what is projected upon him, and he must have a strong sense of the sardonic. This is what uncouples him from belief in his own pretensions. The sardonic is all that permits him to move within himself. Without this quality, even occasional greatness will destroy a man. Paul represents this archetype in another way as well, one which isn't common in older myths, but is becoming more common today. Throughout the book, it becomes clear that Paul's mind is able to calculate possible futures and see them clearly, giving him the ability to essentially see the future, an ability known as prescient vision. This too symbolizes the self, since conscious awareness gives us predictive power and the ability to act contrary to what the future might tell, and the more conscious one is, the stronger this ability. Humans are creatures that are confined to fate, but the highly conscious individual, especially if he is conscious of himself, may be able to escape destiny's snare. The individuated do possess a refined degree of consciousness of themselves, which is why their wills are often stronger than the average person. Paul's awareness of the future gives him some capacity to shape said future. Prophecy and prescience, how can they be put to the test in the face of unanswered questions? Consider, how much is actual prediction of the Wayne form, as Mu'adib referred to as vision, and how much is the prophet shaping the future to fit the prophecy? What of the harmonics inherent in the act of prophecy? Does the prophet see the future, or does he see a line of weakness, a fault or cleavage, that he may shatter with words or decisions, as a diamond cutter shatters his gem with the blow of a knife? It is through these visions that Paul witnesses a horrific future in which the Fremen engage in a jihad against all other planets in the Imperium. Paul, hearing these words, realized he had plunged once more into the abyss, blind time. There was no occupying the future in his mind, except, except he could still sense the green and black Atreides banner waving, somewhere ahead, still see the jihad's bloody swords and fanatic legions. The fanatical Fremen, gripped by the power of the self-archetype, cannot be stopped, and Paul tries to find a way to prevent this dreadful outcome. The horrifying event of the Jihad has also played out in history, during the Muslim conquests, and even fairly recently, when Napoleon led his armies against all of Europe. Figures who proclaim to be messiahs can lead their followers to committing any number of atrocities, and such is the immense power of the self-archetype, and those who embody this archetype. Later revelations show that Paul isn't simply an Atreides, his mother Jessica was unknowingly the daughter of the Baron Harkonnen, the main villain of the story and arch-rival of the Atreides, and so Paul himself is a union of these two opposing factions, yet another symbol of the self-archetype, which unifies opposites to produce psychological wholeness. It is always important to remember that a symbol only has meaning when placed within the context of the larger story in which it appears. Paul is a symbol of the self, but only when his entire psychological journey throughout the course of the novel is understood. Paul not only widens his consciousness, but also delves deeply into his own unconscious, to become increasingly mentally fortified. Paul and Jessica live amongst the Fremen, learning their ways and customs, all while plotting their revenge. The Lady Jessica, aware of the Fremen's prophecies, attempts to use them to ensure Paul's place among them. But before Paul could become leader of the Fremen and avenge his father against the Harkonnens, he must prove that he is worthy and is truly the legend of the prophecies. 
The Fremen are not the uncivilized barbarians, which the Harkonnens believe them to be, but possess a rich culture and knowledge of the desert. Unlike those who are shielded from hardship, the Fremen demonstrate a clear mastery of their own minds, and are tough and brave. The Fremen were supreme in that quality the ancients called Spannungsbogen, which is the self-imposed delay between desire for a thing and the act of reaching out to grasp that thing. Being pushed to the extreme by the desert has made the Fremen tough warriors who are able to fight effectively against the technologically advanced Imperial legions. Their culture also revolves around the spice melange, the precious resource that led to this conflict in the first place. The spice has many properties as a drug, but one thing is clear. In high doses, the spice is a psychedelic, allowing one to reach the inner recesses of their own mind and commune with the depths of their psyche. Paul first experiences this when he is with Chani, a highly symbolic scene since it is the anima which opens a window into the unconscious. Chani feeds Paul the concentrated spice and as Paul experiences the descent into the unconscious, his mind becomes altered. Paul stood beside Chani in the shadows of the inner cave. He could still taste the morsels she had fed him, bird flesh and grain, bound with spiced honey and encased in a leaf. In tasting it, he had realized he had never before eaten such a concentration of spice essence, and there had been a moment of fear. He knew what this essence could do to him, the spice change that pushed his mind into prescient awareness. He sensed it, the raced consciousness he could not escape. There was a sharpened clarity, the inflow of data, the cold precision of his awareness. He sank to the floor, sitting with his back against rock, giving himself up to it. Awareness flowed into that timeless stratum, where he could view time, sensing the available paths, the winds of the future, the winds of the past, the one-eyed vision of the past, the one-eyed vision of the present, and the one-eyed vision of the future, all combined into a trinocular vision that permitted him to see time become space. Psychedelics facilitate ego death, which is precisely what Paul experiences, as he no longer perceives himself as existing merely in the present, but in all times simultaneously. Separated from his ego, Paul experiences a huge inflow of data, and time itself seems to evaporate, allowing him to glimpse numerous possibilities for the future, as he attempts to hold on to his awareness. The journey into the unconscious, which in real life can be facilitated by such mind-altering substances, always precedes the hero attaining a higher consciousness and gaining the knowledge needed to overcome his difficulties. The entire planet is symbolic of this journey. The hostile desert in which one's consciousness is tested, the spice melange, and even the worms, who, as it turns out, are responsible for producing the precious spice. When we dive into the unconscious realms of our mind, we are able to alter our conscious minds and raise our consciousness to a higher level. This is an important psychological law. The development of our consciousness requires sinking back into the unconscious so that a new ego can emerge. This stronger ego may then seize control of the unconscious rather than the other way around. Psychedelics enable one to access their unconscious minds, wherein they encounter the true depths of the psyche. The feminine side of the psyche, in the form of the anima, facilitates this journey, which can be destructive as the ego may never recover. This is why we see symbols of the feminine destroying consciousness in both a positive and negative context, first in the form of the Reverend Mother, and then in the form of Chani. Positive psychological growth can occur through the inflow of unconscious material, but such an inflow at the wrong time such as during a battle, can be utterly destructive. Paul realizes that the Fremen have learned how to call the worms to them, and even how to ride them. This is how the Fremen have been secretly resisting the Harkonnens. The Fremen believe the worms to be godlike creatures, since they are responsible for producing the spice melange. In order for Paul to be fully accepted into the Fremen, he must prove that he is able to ride one of the sandworms. The scene in which Paul successfully manages to climb aboard and ride the sandworm is also highly significant. In a sense, it is as though he has mastered his primordial side, since he is able to command the great beast, and it is a theme seen commonly in myths, as the hero overcoming the dragon. But for Paul, being a symbol of the self, mastery of the sandworm means much more. The self is the entirety of the psyche, consciousness and the unconscious, and a person can only be themselves if these two aspects are in union. The psychological mastery Paul attains seems godlike to the Fremen, who truly begin to believe that he is a living god. We catch a glimpse of Paul's highly developed consciousness during this exchange with his Fremen friend Stilgar. The smile slipped from Paul's face. I saw the drum sand. Then why did you not signal for one of us to take position secondary to you? It was a thing you could do even in the test. Paul swallowed, faced into the wind of their passage. 
You think it is bad of me to say this now, Stilgar said. It is my duty. I think of your worth to the troop. If you had stumbled into that drum sand, the maker would have turned toward you. In spite of his surge of anger, Paul knew that Stilgar spoke the truth. It took a long minute and the full effort of the training he had received from his mother for Paul to recapture a feeling of calm. I apologize, he said. It will not happen again. Even when stung with criticism, Paul was able to swallow his pride and avert his initial emotional unconscious reaction. It is a simple exchange, but it really demonstrates what it means to be conscious to a superlative degree. As Paul becomes revered among the Fremen, as their messiah, he is able to impose his will upon them. Slowly, he saps away their individuality, and they become more slave-like. Paul even notices this. In that instant, Paul saw how Stilgar had been transformed from the Fremen Naib to a creature of the Lisan al Gaib, a receptacle for awe and obedience. It was a lessening of the man, and Paul felt the ghost wind of the Jihad in it. This is yet another glimpse of the dark side of individuation, as the individuated often hold great influence amongst those who have not individuated, who are frequently reduced to lesser men. However, the greatest secret possessed by the Fremen is that of the Water of Life. The Water of Life is a concentrated form of the spice melange produced by drowning a sandworm, a rare event given the scarcity of water on Arrakis. Notice how two distinct symbols of the unconscious, water and the sandworms, yield another psychedelic, one which is more powerful than the spice itself. Normally, only women can take the Water of Life, and the Bene Gesserit used the drug to become reverend mothers as Jessica herself experienced earlier in the novel. This gave her the ability to look into her genetic memory, the memory of past humans, but only in the female line. Due to a genetic flaw, men are not able to take the water of life without dying. But the Bene Gesserit believe they have fixed this problem by producing the Kwisatz Haderach, who should be able to endure the water of life and be able to look into the male side of his genetic memory. Paul senses that he must take the water of life in order to prepare his body and mind for the upcoming battle. And when he does, he enters a deep slumber in which he appears to be dead. His mother, however, knows he is still alive and calls for Chani, his anima, to help awaken him. And it came to pass in the third year of the Desert War that Paul Muad'Dib lay alone in the cave of birds beneath the Kiswa hangings of an inner cell. As he lay as one dead, caught up in the revelation of the water of life, his being translated beyond the boundaries of time by the poison that gives life. Thus was the prophecy made true, that the Lisan al Gaib might be both dead and alive. Paul's rebirth is facilitated by Chani, who is able to bring him back to life. This is another role of the anima in the process of psychological transformation. The anima serves as our doorway into the unconscious, but also as our gateway out. And it is the anima which reconstructs the broken ego, which is why Chani is responsible for resurrecting Paul. While he was unconscious, Paul experienced a sense of timelessness quite characteristic of complete ego death, and it is in this state that he comes to much wisdom about the nature of existence. There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than a man. For a woman, the situation is reversed. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said, that they're ground into each separate cell of our bodies. We're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I can see how such a thing may be. But when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this can overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. These insights by Paul are astonishing from a psychological perspective and very difficult to understand without a background in depth psychology. A man experiences the force which takes as his own animus, essentially as masculinity, which, through the conscious mind, grips and seizes. However, the force that gives, the anima, is unbearable for a man to experience without being transformed, as it is painful for a man to experience his feminine side without experiencing the transformation which it inevitably generates. For women, it is the opposite, since their masculinity is difficult to approach and is contrary to their primary psychological function. These forces, which are ancient forces within the psyche, can be overwhelming to experience, and without balance, they threaten to destroy the opposite function. Paul, through the water of life, has mastered both of these forces, both the masculine and the feminine, and their corresponding psychological functions. 
This individuation has effectively turned Paul into a living god, and in fact, he feels burdened by this immense power. Paul consuming the water of life and unifying masculine and feminine within himself assures to all around him that he is without a doubt the Kwisatz Haderach, and is able to look into both masculine and feminine sides of his genetic memory. Paul, having suffered through the trials of the desert, and having experienced death and rebirth, is individuated and is capable of leading hosts of his Fremen into battle. Through his visions, he finds that the Emperor has come to Arrakis, and amassed an enormous force to crush them. Additionally, he discovers a way to destroy all of the spice on Arrakis, and realizes that he who controls the spice can control the universe, since all interstellar travel is predicated on the lucrative spice. With this information, he confronts his enemies, using the Great Sandworms to annihilate the armies of the Harkonnens and the Imperial Legions. After winning the battle, he confronts his adversaries directly, including the Reverend Mother, whom he met before his journey on Arrakis. She realizes that she has indeed produced the Kwisatz Tadarak, a superhuman with superhuman abilities, and who has fulfilled the prophecies implanted on Arrakis. But she has no control over Paul, who mocks her. Observe her, comrades. This is a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, patient in a patient cause. She could wait with her sisters, 90 generations, for the proper combination of genes and environment to produce the one person their schemes required. Observe her. She knows now that the 90 generations have produced that person. Here I stand, but I will never do her bidding. At last, Paul asserts his independence from the Great Mother, another sign of his psychological autonomy. Through leveraging his ability to destroy the spice, Paul convinces the Emperor to let him marry the Princess Eurolon, effectively becoming the Emperor of the Universe. Thus, he displaces the old ruling power, and becomes the supreme ruler of all mankind, imposing his will upon others, and with no force from above to repress him, he can be himself, yet another reason why great rulers symbolize the self-archetype. However, this great victory is marred by the tragedy of the impending Jihad, where the fanatical Fremen, having witnessed firsthand a living god amongst them, set out across the universe to convert all people to their new religion, and kill all those who oppose. And Paul saw how futile were any efforts of his to change any smallest bit of this. He had thought to oppose the Jihad within himself, but the Jihad would be. His legions would rage out from Arrakis, even without him. They needed only the legend he had already become. He had shown them the way, given them mastery even over the guild, which must have the spice to exist. Paul fails to prevent this outcome, and every vision he has tells him of its inevitability. Like Muhammad and the spread of Islam, or Genghis Khan and the Mongols, Paul's Fremen spread across the galaxy with fire and death, forever changing the universe, and breeding a new religion dedicated to the worship of the Lisan al-Gaib, Paul Atreides. Therefore, while this book describes every process in the stage of individuation, it is also a warning for the dangers involved when the wrong person individuates. They can become the center of an entire people, and grip their minds to the point of complete fanaticism. We become obsessed with such individuals because we see in them what we might someday be. Many individuated leaders use their power to wage wars for their own personal glory, disregarding millions for their own vanity. Humans can be gripped by the self-archetype when they see it in somebody else, and those who individuate often become leaders, since their own individuation is seen as a model for others to follow. This is why we admire great men, even in spite of the evils they commit. Despite the epicness of Paul's journey, Frank Herbert's Dune is ultimately a cautionary tale about the dangers of worshipping great men, who appear to embody the self-archetype. Cautionary tale aside, Dune still teaches us many philosophical lessons about the nature of consciousness and how this consciousness is able to transcend our basic psychological makeup. Through consciousness, humans have become more and more godlike, and as our consciousness evolves, we will gain the knowledge needed to spread across the stars and push the boundaries of what it means to be human. Thanks for watching. Dune is seriously one of my favorite novels of all time, and I say that only having read it for the first time last year. It was just that archetypally relevant and so philosophically deep about the nature of consciousness that it immediately became one of my favorites. There's still so much I can say about it, but given that this video is already this long, I thought I would just cut it here. Please share this video as I put a lot of work into it, and if you know any Dune fans, please show them this video since it might just give them a new perspective on one of their favorite works. Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed. Have a good day, and may good luck always come your way.